Hello, I am the Penguin. You might know me from those specific moments, maybe the time where Max uh, grabbed my peepee. -pee. I have key. Can you steal the key from my hand? Oh no, that's my groin. That's not the key. <laughs> it was it was hard like a key. Or maybe from one of my famous cameos on other people's streams, the time I said Mercedes Beans instead of Mercedes uh, Benz on Artery Stream. We got the Mercedes Beans. I like beans, that. beans. Beans. Yes, Mercedes <laughs> Beans. Mercedes <laughs> Benz Express. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about the games I played in June, because I want to chronologue games I play every month and every year, because I always have a list of all games I've beaten at the end of the year. So this time I was like, hmm, why don't I make a video about every month of the games I've played and talk about some of them and make like a top five at the end, which ones I really liked and talked about them, a more in-depth, pretty much. So here is a list of all the games I've played from June. You have Crossfire, Rubber Bandits. Motor GP20, GP uh, FIFA 22, uh, Dark Alliance, Dungeons and Dragons, Deer Simulator, you average every day, Deer Game, Zombie Army 4, Dead War, NBA 2K17, Worms Rumble. But yeah, I have other games I want to talk more about, so let's get into that. First, we have Alone in the Dark on the 360. If you guys caught any of the stream when I streamed through the whole Alone in the Dark, it's one of the jankiest games I've ever played. There's segments in that game that absolutely infuriate me, especially the parts with the goo where you have to shine a light on it to get past. It's brutal for fucking sure. One of my biggest pet peeves in games is also when the game forces you to do side missions to progress on the campaign or progress on the main story of the game. For me, just unnecessary extra prolonging the game and not fun at all. But you know what? The developers tried a lot of things and were very ambitious. I have to give them some credit for that because there are so many games, especially today, a AAA games, not in the indie games are fucking trying everything, but there's a lot of AAA games that just remaster the same old shit, try the same thing that everyone's trying. Like, for example, the last 10 years with <coughs> Battle Royales. I'm just tired of that shit. Before that, you had Minecraft. Before that, blah, 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 blah. Everyone's trying to do the, be the next thing. So I really appreciate that they tried something. But they might have been a bit too ambitious, if you might say. But for a 2008 game, the game looks really damn good. Like the graphics on it, the fire, the breakable environments, uh, the revolutionary inventory system where you just open up your jacket and then you have your things that you need you have like molotov cocktails you have uh, bandages you have healing you have healing sprays and you can combine them but it looks really cool and it's a very interesting and nice looking inventory system if it if the inventory system works and or not eh, that's a difference in itself i'm like I said, the game is fucking janky. It doesn't matter where it is. It's the inventory system, in-game, where you shoot, everything. Every mechanic feels off, especially platforming. That's brutal. The most interesting thing, though, with the inventory system, it's the inventory system used in this game would be more famous later on in a few years in survival games. But I would say the most positive thing about the game is the chapter select system it has. It reminds me more of a DVD when you can skip through parts instantly, when you just skip skip part button, so it doesn't skip the whole chapter, but you can, in the chapter you have like three, four, five, six different parts, you can instantly go and play that part, so you don't have to replay the whole chapter. And for people going back for teams and such like that, if that was in other games, ooh, it would have been so much better. In the end, it's an ambitious game that tries way too much, but fails in most aspects in nearly all of it just thanks to the jankiness of it platforming brutal melee combat is awful and the story <laughs> the story is so bad it could be good as well the voice the main voice actor is the one in max, that plays max Payne as well so they have good people in it trying their hardest i'm the light bringer i'm the fucking universe I don't really hate the game, to say. I respect a lot of stuff, considering that the developers are more known to make racing games. So 
they were very ambitious with this uh, or action third person shooter so and part first person shooter as well but yeah but in the end it just left a bad taste in my mouth gameplay wise so yeah i, I gave it two and a half stars out of five I have mm, porco dio madonna porco 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 porque Speaking of ratings, I want to talk to you about how I rate games. I have a specific criteria and it ranges from half a star to five stars. Anything below that I, I don't I, Anything that's classed under half a star is not real game in my opinion. You can't rate anything under half a star in my opinion. So if the game isn't playable or the game isn't functioning or it's not even a game, I can't give it a star rating at all. So I rate them in a mixture of a few things. So I call it my funometer. So it has to be fun for me through the gameplay. Even it, it does have to be fun to per se so that I enjoy it. But it's supposed it is supposed to be a mix of fun, how good the game is, and comparably how good it was to other games similar to it at its era when it came out. Because you can't really compare games from back in the day to today. Let's take for example Star Fox or Star Wing for Europeans on the Super Nintendo. The game looked back in the day absolutely gorgeous, played pretty damn good, and was a really good game. But if you would play it through 2022 eyes, you will notice a lot of people who didn't grow up playing it would be like, it's way too slow, it's way too boring, and the graphics look really bad 3D. <clears throat> so I would rate it a four star because I think about the games that came out back then and compare it to other games, especially on Super Nintendo, and it's one of the nicest looking 3D games on Super Nintendo. So yeah, I would, you can't really rate with today's standards. Next game up in the list is Generation Zero, another game I fully played on stream. I played it co-op with Max and a few times we also had Sin Mama and Archery join me. Since I first saw the trailer I was hyped, like imagine an open world FPS game set in Sweden with a story about robots taking over the country and there's not a lot of people left so you get to roam around Sweden that's pretty dead and full with deadly robots that you have to kill, sounded really damn good to me. The game is set when the Berlin Wall falls down in the 90s in an alternative universe where Sweden gets invaded by these robots. So you as the player get to roam through Sweden and try to find people alive just by looking through stuff. So if, for example, you would loot houses, you loot cars, you loot dead bodies if you can find anything to survive. So it's, it's a mix of like a survival first person shooter game. For me, the first like few hours of the game, say the first 10 hours of the game, was really fun. I enjoyed just exploring everything, trying to find everything that I could, like anything that reminds myself of Sweden. So you could see like they had Easter eggs of stuff. So like you had our ice cream that's called Gibbeglass in the game, they call it something else and it's a clown instead, exactly like the, it is in ours. You had Ikea in the game, which had a different name. You had Coop in the game that also had another name. It's real stores that we have in Sweden. And then you had like names for specific stuff, like Kopist is a machine gun in Swedish. And just a lot of Easter eggs for Swedes that we really enjoy going through. We're like, oh, I remember that. Or like in the kiosk where you have small chewing gums that you can buy for 50 euro back in the day. So yeah, it was like all of that made me, it made, it got me a boner. With my mullet, I look like fucking Wayne Gretzky as well. So do you like my helmet? Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Graphically, the game looks amazing. It's one of the nicest looking games I've ever played, especially with the Swedish environment as well, being Swede. But the funniest thing is when I played the game with Max, uh, Mad Max, a, f a very famous mod of mine, and also I play most of my games on stream, co-op games with him. He said a comment because he was playing Cyberpunk at the same time. And he was like, man, the rain in Generation Zero is so much better than Cyberpunk, which I found really funny. But the deeper you get into the game, you start to notice how repetitive it gets. The same buildings that they've just 
copy pasted everywhere you have the same fucking missions you have to do same robots push you it's the same monotonous kind of action where you just have to go backwards forwards killing the same robots and some of the robots are literally bullet sponges it takes maybe 9 to 20 rocket launchers to kill it like the, the rockets continuously shooting there were some parts of the action that was so repetitive but still was really good and i remember at the airport one of the my favorite parts there was it was constantly like seven to ten really big robots just fucking fighting you and it it lasted like 40 minutes of gameplay just us trying to kill these most of us got good loot we didn't get the legendary weapon looks to be you but in most bunkers you could see the problem with the copy pasting especially because they had everything in the same location they changed around a few parts but it was mostly just the same so you would see like the same texture bug in one of the toilets where one of the wall collided with the other wall so you could see like a wall going inwards and we noticed it for every bunk we went that toilet was in every bunker so uh, you could instantly notice the copy pasting which is understandable it's a very big map so you have to fill up the map but at the same time when you're like 30 40 hours into the game you're like mm, it's the same shit and i'm getting it's a quite a repetitive shit as well oh the weapons by the by the water oh oh my god bye guys i'm falling i'm falling i'm falling uh, uh oh no i'm uh yeah. I'm back. The game gets very underwhelming towards like the end of it because the story in the game is not there is a story but it's very vague and you get it most through recordings that you pick up and I'm not gonna spoil if you find people or not that's up to you if you want to play it but yeah it's there like all of the recordings mostly are it's interesting but it lacks something that you're hooked on. It lacks like motivation to keep going. So if I would play this offline, I would not enjoy it at all. It, it wasn't my kind of thing, but thankfully I had Max and then I had Moo and Archer joined for most of them. So it was fun just doing stupid shit like launching yourself with a rocket launcher through half the map. I Like you're seeing right now, literally just shooting and flying through the whole motherfucking map. But yeah. It was fun to do just... It's a looter shooter, pretty much. You shoot robots, you collect what you get. Sometimes they drop a weapon that's really good. You use it to kill more robots, and so on and so on, to, to finally beat the game. After the game, there's also extra content where you can kill really big robots because they have a level up system. So when you don't kill them after a while, they level up and get bigger and bigger and bigger and harder to kill. But also you get better loot. So it's a, it's a good trade-off at the end. If you're a Swede, I'd give it a try. You like a lot of the Easter eggs, you like the environment, you feel right at home pretty much. It's based in the 90s, but most of the stuff still feels like... If you've grown up in the 90s, or even the 2000s, like early 2000s, you will get some of the stuff 100%. Most fun in the game you'll have is playing it with other friends. So if you can get a couple of friends playing together, even two people going through the map, is more fun than going at it alone. I would not recommend it as a solo game, it's not fun. Because... With friends, you can create absolute chaos. You can be a douchebag to each other. And uh, we always appreciate team killing. Okay. I'm going to go. Let's go. One, two, and then shoot. Are ready? Yeah. Let's go. One, two, shoot. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> we all flew away. Bye. <laughs> Consensual team killing. That is. Yeah, I had really good fun with the game. And uh, what more can you say? If you have fun with the game, you're enjoying the game. So the game lacks a lot of stuff, but man, I I had fun with it. I give it three out of five stars. I would have lowered the star rating if you played it a solo. I would give it like two, two stars or two and a half stars as a solo. But as a team or a four people, up to four people, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, three stars. <laughs> we learned from oh, the best. Wait. Oh, I um, would have been close to me, Archery. See what I mean? The last game I want to talk about before we reach the top five is Last Stop, which was a game that I wouldn't have normally played, 
if it wasn't on Game Pass. I just scroll through because every month Game Pass has like a list at the beginning of the month and in the middle of the month. They have a new games list of games that will leave Game Pass. So you have like 14 days to play through them until they leave Game Pass. And one of them was Last Stop. And I was like, hmm, it looks interesting. Let's try it out. Last Stop is like a choose yourself adventure game where your choices dictates the game. So it's pretty much like a telltale game if you ever played those. The most famous one for me is Walking Dead. One of them, especially season one. Oh, good game. The game is very simplistic as well. So if you've never really played the game or you're very new to playing a game, you could easily just jump into this game and you could enjoy it for most of it. There's no real gameplay to it. It's just button presses. And what I've seen, there's not a lot of button press that can fuck you up or make you fail. It literally shows on the screen what to press. And most of them have not been like, press it within this or you fail like, like in the darker picture games or those kinds of games. The game is set in a 2020 London where you get to take control over three people living in the city. Three people is John Smith, a middle-aged father, Mina Hughes, a high-level agent, and Donna Adelaide, a teenage student, pretty much. The game starts out quite normal, but quickly you'll start to see where things happen for sure. Anything more than that, I can't really go into because it's high spoiler territory. One of those games you just play once. Pretty much a one-stop experience you know like when you have a movie that's really good the first time you see it but the more times you see it you're like eh it doesn't do me for anymore because i know what's going to happen or it's it's built up in such a way that it's supposed to surprise you but the more times you look at it you're like eh it didn't surprise me more it's not that enjoyable the second time it's one of those games really good the first time but you don't really have a reason to replay it the biggest issue i have with this game is that it doesn't really matter which choices you make 95% of the time to until you get to the ending. That's where it actually matters what you, the choice you make to get the real endings and stuff. But until then, it's just meaningless choices that will lead you down the same road so you can press any button, pretty much. Which I feel in a choose yourself adventure game, your choices should matter. Otherwise, why would you choose any of the time? You just can go through the last chapter and be like, okay, now I matter. I have to shave off like half a star of it instantly because that's one of the biggest things you need in an adventure game is that your choices actually matter and lead to another line in the story instead of it doesn't matter until the end and then you just choose one of the endings or not so yeah not fun but if you want most of the achievements they're pretty easy to get you just have to pick a specific choice and then you get that achievement so it's a really easy replay i played through the game a full time and only missed three achievements, which I could just go back to by chapter based and just pick them up. So I got this was an easy, perfected game, like a really good TV show. It kept me hooked. It made me want to see more of it. It made me want to sit through the whole in one sitting. So I sat four hours of the sitting. I sat in one sitting and I sat one in the beginning. So it was a five hour game, pretty much. So I wouldn't say it's worth going out of your way to play it. But if it's really cheap and you like that sort of game, it's a really fun one. And especially the story got me hooked. So I what I can't say anything negative about that. I gave Last Stop three and a half stars out of five. Now we're getting to the meat and bones, the top five games I've played this month. Starting off, Project Gotham Racing. When someone says to you an original Xbox game, you usually think of like, Halo 2, you think of Fable, you think of Ninja Gaiden, Knights of the Old Republic, those kinds of games. But no one really mentions Project Gotham Racing, at least not in my uh, my like friend circle. A lot of people don't mention Project Gotham Racing when they mention original Xbox games. And they should because uh, the series uh, Project Gotham Racing is very good and a lot of people have praised it through the years. but. I've never played through the first one, so I was like, huh, I, I should play it to just historically see how racing games were at that time. And I found it pretty cheap in one retailer we had that sells uh, older video games, and they had a really good price. I was like, okay, let's get this thing. If there's one thing on Xbox that people don't really talk about is the amount of amazing racing games, it has to be honest. You have Burnout 3, Midnight Club 3, Forza Motorsport, Rally Sport Challenge, EGR, the Project Gotham Racing, was a launch title in the Xbox in 2001 and showed off what the console could do and uh, how it could hold up to PlayStation's Gran Turismo series. Project Gotham Racing is a perfect mix in between 
arcade racing and simulation racing because all the cars feel different and they're very simulated in driving wise but most of the missions and most of the fun you have in the game is more arcade like so like <clears throat> the game has a kudo system which rewards you for doing fun things like drifting if you have clean driving without touching everyone if you're overtaking another racer you gain kudos and with those kudos you can complete missions so every level in the game is different compared to racing games in the other racing games your main mission is to win the race or get high enough to get points in the long run in like a grand prix so you can win at the end in this game though you have to get enough kudos to actually win to get to the next challenge which is a different approach to take which i like i'm always a big fan of different in video games and it brings a new difficulty to the game as well because in most racing games you can just be one spot and win and that's all in this game you have to be really good at the later part of the game to actually get to those parts because i noticed like in the first there's 12 uh, chapter challenges that you go through and the first five were just easy you don't have to worry about it when you get up to the seventh chapter then it actually gets harder and i noticed it was a bit too hard at times but the more you just played and learned it you could just play through it you could lower the difficulty but only the difficulty would lower the kudos so you had to perform even better drifts better clean driving and better speeds to get more kudos there's a lot of racing tracks in this game that are set in four different cities. You have San Francisco, London, Tokyo and New York. So in three countries pretty much. The soundtrack also has absolute bangers from Good Charlotte, Iggy Pop, Gorillaz, Sir Mix-a-Lot, The Chemical Brothers and Timberland. Nothing like cruising around in the Gorillaz 192000s while playing this game and hitting gnarly drifts. It took me around seven hours to beat and complete all challenges which unlocked even new challenges to do, which were a lot harder, which was like 10 laps on a, a lot harder difficulty, where when you came into like lap nine, people started overtaking you. So it was an actual real damn challenge. But the game has a lot of replayability and keeps you wanting coming back from because it's really good, especially back in the day for a launch title. It's amazing. Indian Xbox had a really good launch lineup, for example, because their games were good. But also they were even better with friends so in the list you had like dead or alive 3 halo combat evolved and project gotham racing which all of the three are good to play as a solo but even better to play with friends i give project gotham racing four out of five stars number four on my list is the quarry another game from the developers of until dawn and the dark pictures trilogy the quarry is actually a very star-studded one as well you have Ted Raimi, David Arquette, Lance Hendrickson, Ariel Winter, Brenda Song, Justice Smith, and Ethan Supli. If you, Ethan Supli, if this is the one from My Name is Earl, his uh, brother. And also American History X fame. The story takes place at the summer camp when you take control of nine teenage counselors as they stay one more night at Hackett's Quarry. The biggest difference I found in this game is compared to the other supermassive games in the series is the jump scares aren't really there it's more of a slasher movie slash game slash slash no but it's more of a slasher game so there's not a lot of jump scares really more of the scary parts is you're trying to run away or trying to survive moments but there aren't a lot of jump scares and i find it to be more positive because until dawn had so many jump scares that they weren't even scary anymore they were just happening constantly every second you're like okay if you built up the jump scare, I would have actually been scared, but you're just doing... <laughs> For anyone who hasn't played any of the Supermassive games before, it's a linear adventure game with a lot of quick time events. It's literally what the game is about. It's quick time events and reacting to it, pretty much. I, I would compare it to, like, the Telltale games or Life is Strange. There's the two games I can compare it to, but yeah, it's more hardcore adventure, uh, pick your own adventure game compared to the one I named before. I played the PC version of this game two days after it was released and I just ran into one major bug that was fixed by just repairing a file on Steam. But yeah, the quick time events were a lot easier as well than comparably to Until Dawn or Dark Picture Trilogy. They changed how it looked, so now you don't get the button instantly, you have to wait a bit and then it shows, which gives you less moments to react but also 
you don't have to press instantly and press the wrong button you can wait and then you just okay so it didn't stop me from having a, an ex a really good experience but i found it to be a lot easier so if that ruins your gameplay then you know how to think about it also big thanks to aggressively he just gifted me the game and wanted me to play it and made one hell of a stream so big thanks to you aggressively i give uh, the quarry four out of five stars now uh, number three on my list umaragi generation have you ever thought to yourself hmm i wonder what would happen if we took photography and mix it with challenges and timing from tony hawk's pro skater that's what umaragi generation is umaragi generation is an fps photography game based in a fictional new zealand during an impending crisis where the un is deploying soldiers to defend the island from invaders while this is happening you and your four friends includes a penguin by the way just enjoy your time together while also photographing all the hell that comes in the way the game is based off like i said to i can compare it to tony hawk that's my best comparison every level has different sub goals in it so you have like eight main goals you have to do to beat the level and then you have sub goals underneath you can do as well to get more points so to beat level you have to do specifically eight missions for to photograph specifically eight things and then the ending opens up and you continue to the next stage but you can also stay and within the time and try to get more things to unlock other parts the game also rewards you for your creativity so the more creative you are the more points you get at the end of the level you just start off with a regular dslr camera but the more objectives you complete and the more challenges you do you get new lenses on it to take more creative and more interesting pictures i would tell more of the story but i do not want to go into detail for it because it's spoiler territory and while the game doesn't tell you the story it shows you the story so if you just keep an eye on everything it tells you a really good story i love it when a developer takes a big risk in making a game and does something that's never been done before just because he wants to create his own vision in a game not that he wants to make a game that everyone specifically are craving for and it ended up being a one hell of a good experience as well i also love the messaging in the game that in life you can't really control there's a lot of stuff you can't control in with your own grasp but it doesn't mean that life has, has to suck you can make the most out of it and still have fun in the absolute worst parts but in the end why why not enjoy hell with your friends right it took me about three to four hours to 100 percent complete the game it wasn't so bad and it also had free dlc so if you thought the game was way too short you also have three extra levels as dlc for free if you want to play something completely different and something that has a very lovely and chill vibes as well it's a really good pick and i really recommend it it's one of my favorite games of the year i'll give umaragi generation four out of five stars number two teenage mutant ninja turtles shredder's revenge how do you follow up an arcade classic like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1989 and the Turtles in Time game. Well, like this. I grew up playing a lot of games with my brother and shared most of my favorite gaming moments with him. The first moment I ever played, uh, one of my first memories I ever played with him, that's to say. My first memories of playing with him was playing TMNT on the uh, MAME. I remember it was a TMNT Metal Slug Simpsons the arcade game we played together and it was a lot of fun. When it came to Turtles, he would always pick Leonardo. And I would go with Donatello because I really liked his long stick. But beat-em-ups as a genre has really slowed down throughout the years. I would say it's probably because with the arcades dying down in like the mid-90s to late-90s, so did coin-munching arcade games. So you don't see as many beat-em-ups nowadays as you saw before. When Shredder's Revenge was first announced and the trailer came out, I wasn't too impressed with the graphics. But at the same time, the producers were .emu. And if you know, if you haven't heard of .emu before, their track record of games they have published or developed lately have been really damn good. Other games that I absolutely love in their series are Wonder Boy, The Dragon's Trap, the remake that they did, and Streets of Rage 4. Both of them are highly rated by me. And they also made Windjammers, which I haven't played, but I've heard a lot of good stuff about. But enough talking about .emu they are fucking amazing i want to give some highlight to the developers of the game tribute games 
because they put a lot of love and passion into the game. It's truly a love letter to all those old, older TMNT beat em ups. So they pleased both the TV series and the arcade game. So it was like a perfect mix. This time you can play as up to six people at the same time, and the game also supports crossplay. I played the game with my brother on the easiest setting on Xbox Series X as a duo, and I played it with five other friends on PC on the hardest setting through Game Pass as a six man team. And both of the times, it was fucking amazing. I enjoyed it heavily. My only nitpick I have to say about the game is that ultimates are way too overpowered. Way too overpowered. Literally, we're playing it on the hardest difficulty on stream with uh, my other five people. And uh, the only thing that happened was constantly people taunting, finish. Taunting, ultimate. Taunting, finish. Taunting, ultimate. And it was parts that was really funny where all of us were doing the ultimate at the same time because the screen would just freeze because it was like all six of them going at the same time. It was funny and we had a hell of a time, but it literally overpowered anything the enemies had. But outside of that nitpick, there is no other nitpick I have about this game. It was fucking amazing. You could play as Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, Michelangelo, the famous turtles. And then you could play as April, Splinter, and minor spoiler, after you beat the game, you unlock Casey Jones. Also, the four turtles are voiced by their original TMNT series voice actors. The new soundtrack as well fits perfectly with the turtles universe and it's rad as hell. The pacing is amazing as well. Throughout the 16 stages that are packed with variety, I found the pacing to not be too long like most beat em up games. It was just the perfect size so you didn't feel bored because the level kept on going and going and going. There's also challenges per stage now that give you extra XP or collectibles to collect that also gives you XP, which powers up your character to get either more life, you get a special move, or at the end you get you can stack up to two or three ultimates instead. Red. Pizza, pizza, yeah. pizza, let's go, pizza, let's go. Pizza, oh my god. Pizza. Ow. Pizza, pizza, pizza. Everyone get up, everyone get up. Yeah. Yes. Woo. Let's go. Very nice. If you are a Turtles fan and you like old school beat em up games, go play this game. Like, there's, there's nothing to say that. It's on fucking Game Pass. You can just sign up to Game Pass for one euro and get a month. I think they might have a deal right now for three months even. I'm not sure at this moment. But it needs to be stated. If you like the trucks, if you have Game Pass, if you like just beat them up games, or you just want to have a game that you can casually play with a younger brother or like a younger sibling, if you want to play with your son or a daughter, if you want to play with anyone, this is the perfect game and also pay for it. If you really love it, if you have the money to support them, really give the support to the creators. They did an amazing job and they deserve to get the money. Like, I forgot the name of the web. Like Tribute Games and .mu did an awesome job. .mu gets credit for it just because they have the track record, but it's Tribute Games that made a delicious game and they deserve all the money for it. So make sure if you can, and if you love the game, pay them. I'm giving the game Five stars out of five stars. Oh my god, he's still, ooh, he's still Ow, eating those bananas. He threw a banana at you. <laughs> the monkey threw a banana. <laughs> this is gonna be the worst because we're all down here and they're throwing stuff at us, just you know. Like the pizza. Hold up. Ow. Monkey. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll take a hit to make the play. Let's go. Let's go. Number one on my list, Super Mario Odyssey. This right here is a system selling game. This is what should have been a release game for a Switch. But what I can just say about this game, it's it's an absolute masterpiece. Like it's when you think of the best Mario games of all time, 2D fans, you'd say Mario 3 or Mario World for the 3D fans you'll say mario 64 or mario galaxy they are like the top four games that can't be touched then you have <clears throat> lower games in the series that they have a lot of hardcore fans like the sunshine there's a there's a small fans that really love sunshine more than anything i don't know what to say sunshine sucks fuck you sunshine it's charming but it's definitely not up there what if i told you 
that Odyssey has a mix of both. You have some 2D parts that are really good, but also there are 3D parts that are mm, so good. So f fucking orgasmically good. Mm, the movement and gameplay of Odyssey is just the best it's ever been. Backflips, long jumps, triple jumps, anything you see is so goddamn good. Like I've been speedrunning Super Mario 64 for a bit. And I really like this Mario 64 because the control of Mario, it's never the game's fault. Every control movie you do, if you fuck up, it's your fault. You're not doing it perfectly. So the more I played it, the more I learned the controls, you can do the same in this game. You're in control. All the movements you do, you can cheese the game, you can break the game by just doing your own movements. So if you're good enough with perfectly precision jumps, you can make it up to stuff that you're not supposed to make through at the beginning. You have to go through another way. I broke most of the stars by just glitching up and boop, 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 boop. Oh, I got it. Nice. And then they're further up in the game. You're like, oh, you're supposed to go around the whole map to get up there. And I was like, oops. I might be too good. <clears throat> Super Mario Galaxy was set in space. And you, had, you could travel through the universe through different plants and stuff. And it felt big. But this is set in different locations. And they feel a bit bigger than Galaxy, which should make sense, which is a stronger console, but the levels feel bigger than ever before. It truly feels like a free-roaming Mario game. And after playing, uh, I can't see myself going back to a Galaxy again. Odyssey's open world is so good, and you don't have to wait in between, like, oh, I collected a star, time to go back, and then go in again. This game gameplay is a lot better, because you just... It just feels so natural, just keep on collecting, keep on, keep on. And there's so much stuff to collect in the game as well, it's insane. The amount of replayability is just through the roof, from collecting outfits, to collecting all the stars. After beating it, you get even more things to collect and unlock. By collecting specific coins, you can unlock costumes. By, uh, by, licking. by collecting stars, you can unlock other stuff as well. So the more stars you get, you unlock stuff. The more coins you get, you unlock stuff. The more, if you beat the game, you get even more stuff to unlock. There's so many of everything. If you have amiibos, they support them as well. With amiibos, you can find locations of uh, specific hidden stars. With amiibos, you can get costumes. It literally has everything in one package. The worlds you travel to feel so vibrant and so beautiful as well. From like a simplistic desert level to the jungle to i forgot the stages the music in odyssey might be one of the most underappreciated soundtracks it's so jazzy so catchy it's it might not live up to the classic mario 3 soundtrack mario world mario 64 for some people galaxy but it's so good so fucking good i Specifically one song that I it's so good and it's one of my favorite Mario songs of all time and that is Jump Up Superstar. You can hear the Jump Up Superstar play at the end of this video. It's not gonna be the original one because Nintendo will They will fuck me. I've been playing it with my brother and after one or two stars each we pass the controller around so we both get to play different levels and we constantly get to play and have fun pretty much. The game is around 35 hours and we finished the game after 35 hours and we're not even done collecting everything yet. So this game has so much content even after you're done with the game. 35 hours just because we're going for 100% completion. So 35 hours we've collected all coins and stars on every level. But when you beat the game, new stuff unlocks. So you have to go back and collect even more if you want 100% it. So I can't recommend the game enough with how much content it has. Love 3D platformers, doesn't matter what kind, doesn't matter if you don't like Mario, if you like platformers, if you're a 3D platforming fan, do yourself a favor and get the game. Go for it, just fucking do it. It's one of the best platform 3D platformers of all time. I rarely recommend anyone to buy a game at a full $60. Rarely do it. I feel like most games, sh like I wait until they go down to 40 or 30 to be like, yeah, you should get the game. Especially when it comes to Nintendo that no, never fucking lowers their physical A-list games for under 40 pretty much. But yeah, this game, 
well worth the sixty dollars. It's not sixty at the moment; it's probably lower than that, but it's worth it. Trust me. You get if you're specifically if you're a three D platformer, you get amazing gameplay, you get amazing soundtrack, <coughs> you get a lot of collectibles and value for your money, <coughs> and you can play it on the fucking go as well. You can literally sit on your sit on your bed. You pretty much lay on your bed. You can literally lay on your bed. You can sit on your chair. You can be out on a vacation somewhere and play the game. You can be on the bus and play the game. You can sit in the back of a car and play the game. You can be playing it at work. Or you can play it in front of a big ass screen. All of them, an absolute masterpiece of a game. Mario Odyssey, five fucking stars out of five fucking stars. So in the list, at number five, Project Gotham Racing. Number four, The Quarry. Number three, Umaragi Generation. Number two, Termi Terminator. Number two, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. And number one, Super Mario Odyssey. So that was June for me. That's the games I've been playing in June. That's the fun I've had in June. It's been a great month for video games. It's been a great month for streams as well. It's been a fucking good ass time, that's for sure. But yes, let's see what July has in store. If can, if it can stand up to it, it's gonna be hard to top Mario Odyssey. It's gonna be top. It's gonna be hard to top Mario Odyssey at the end of the year as well. It's so good, so so fucking good. And even like Turtles, a fucking amazing game. It's gonna be hard to top. But yes, thank you all for watching. I am the Penguin, and I'll see you again next time. Hard stall. Bye. For this game is that you. Umaragi Generation is an FPS photography game based in a fictional New, J New Jersey. That's not. But it's an indie game. The game also rewards you with penises. Too bad. Sort of how good the expos I'm shaving off half a star because why it's not funny oh, around five hours three I'm I've been it's like some of the buildings the levels you take control of you you take control of you of course you